Hi, everybody. Uh, today, I would like to, s to begin this lecture from uh, discussing, uh, by discussing the solutions to the written test problems. Uh, the written test was not very uh, difficult. Last year, uh, the test problems were much more complicated than this year. But regardless of the fact that the problems were quite simple, many students uh, did not solve the problems correctly. So <coughs> I will start from the first problem. A stone is dropped vertically down. So we have a stone which is dropped vertically down from the height h of 20 meters. <coughs> And then the stone hits the ground. <coughs> and then uh, after the first stone is thrown, the second stone is down with some initial velocity. The second stone. So uh, there are two stones, the first one and the second one. Uh, the second stone is thrown after time interval one second. <coughs> But both stones strike the ground at the same moment in time. So we have to find the initial velocity of the second stone. So that was the first stone, and that is the second stone. And we need to find the initial velocity with which the second stone was the initial velocity of the second stone. <coughs> so first one stone is dropped. And then the second stone, after one second, is dropped down with some initial velocity. That's it. We have to find the initial velocity if the both stones hit the ground at the same moment in time. Uh, well, the solution is very simple, certainly. It's kinematic, kinematics and the kinematic formula for displacement if the body moves at constant uh, acceleration of free fall, the displacement is initial velocity plus acceleration times squared over 2. For the first stone, the initial velocity was 0, according to the statement of this problem. So for the first stone, we have this formula. That's the height equals acceleration of free fall, the time in motion squared over 2. Everything is given in this formula. The height is given as 20 meters, and the acceleration of free fall is known. So we can find the time which took the first stone to hit the ground, to reach the ground surface. So from this formula, we obtain uh, that the time is 2h divided by the acceleration of free fall. That is a square root of 2 times 20 meters divided by approximately 10 meters per second squared. Approximately 10 meters. We always use this approximation unless otherwise stated in the problem. So 20 divided by 10 is 2. 2 times 2, 4. So we have square root of 4. That is 2 seconds. It took two seconds for the first stone to reach the ground surface. The first stone was in motion for the period of two seconds. And the second stone was, was dropped one second later. And both the stones hit the ground at the same moment. Therefore, the second stone was in motion just for one second. So the time that was the time in motion for the first stone and for the second stone, it's obviously that the time in motion for the second stone is the time in motion for the first stone minus, uh, minus this delta t one second. So two seconds minus one. Two minus one is what? One. Very simple, but not everybody was able to do it. Not everybody was smart enough to make this calculation. 
OK, so only one second for the second stone to reach the ground. And what was the equation of motion for the second stone? The displacement, the vertical displacement for the second stone. Now we have to take this formula because v0 is not, the initial velocity is not 0 for the second stone. And the time t2 for the second stone plus gt2 squared over 2. I don't remember who, but somebody, some of my students, uh, placed minus sign here. Why minus? V0 is directed downward, and the uh, acceleration of free fall as a vector is also directed downward. So these two terms are directed, have the same direction, are both directed downward. So they, they must have the same sign here, not the opposite signs, because they are not directed oppositely. They are directed in the same, in the same pointing in the same direction. <coughs> So in this formula for the second stone, everything is known. The height is known, 20 meters. The time in motion is known, one second. So it's, it's not difficult to find the only unknown quantity, which is the initial velocity. And from this formula, the initial velocity will be what? h divided by t2, the height divided by t2, minus g after dividing by t2 we will have g t2 divided by 2 so everything is known this is 20 meters and this is one second so the first term equals to 20 and the second term again 10 meters per second squared divided by 2 and multiplied by one second that will be minus 10 divided by 2, 5. So the final velocity is 15. So we have found that the initial velocity, v0, was 15 meters per second. That's the answer to the first problem. And the solution is based on well-known kinematic formulas. Also, uh, it says, it has another question. Is it possible that delta t equals 2 seconds? Well, if delta t is 2 seconds, then here we will have 2 minus 2, 0. Only 0, 0 time is left for the motion of the second stone. Can we divide by 0 in this formula? t2 will be 0. No. Can we divide by 0? No. We if we divide by 0, we will obtain infinite velocity. So in case, in case delta t equals 2 seconds, the velocity, the initial velocity of the second stone should be infinite. Is it possible? Well, it's up to you to decide. OK, next problem, uh, problem number 2. A constant horizontal force of 10 newtons acts on a 5 kilogram bar that can move along the plane horizontal surface with friction coefficient given as 0.1. So we have a bar of given mass m, and the mass is 5 kilograms. And that bar can move along a horizontal surface, a flat horizontal surface. And a force F is applied, constant force F, which is also given. It's 10 newtons. A constant force F is acting on this bar. What work will be performed by force F during the first two seconds? So we have a time interval, two seconds is given. And we need to find work done by, the first, uh, done by the force F during the first two seconds of bar motion. What will be the kinetic energy of the bar by that moment? The initial speed of the bar is 0. Initially, it was at rest. 
at the initial moment of time it was at rest. Air drag is negligible. So we need to find the work done in two, four, in two seconds. The work of force F, it's stated in the um, problem that we need to find the work performed by force F. Are there any other forces acting on the bar? Certainly. There is a force of gravity pull Mg, and there is a force of friction. If the bar moves to the right, then the force of friction acts in opposite direction, opposite to the velocity. So we have actually several forces. Certainly there is a force of reaction from the surface, which is equal to the bar weight and oppositely directed, so that these two forces balance each other. But these two forces, the force F, capital F, and force of friction do not balance each other, most probably, but sometimes they do. Sometimes the force of friction is balanced by external force. For example, if I try to move the object, but I apply a small force, the object doesn't move because the force of friction balances the external force. And in order for the object to move, the external force must be larger than the force of friction. Then there will be motion. What about this problem? Is force F actually larger than force of friction? It's easy to establish that force of friction is coefficient of friction times normal reaction of the surface. This is by definition of coefficient of friction. And that will give you 0.1 times n, which is equal to mg. And that will give you 0.1. The mass is 5 kilograms. And g is 10 meters per second squared. So that will be 5 times 10 is 50. And divided by 10 is 5 newtons. So the force of friction is 5 newtons. And the external force acting on the body is 10. So that the external force is surely larger than the force of friction. And therefore, the, the bar will move along the sur surface with acceleration. Because according to the second Newton's law, a total force acting on the bar in horizontal direction that is force of friction, uh, external force capital F minus the force of friction will be given as the mass of the bar times its acceleration. So if the force of friction is larger than small f, if external force is larger than the force of friction, then there will be some positive acceleration. And we can easily determine the acceleration from this equation. That will be. Uh, the force of friction, of or external force minus force of friction, 10 minus 5. So that will be 5 newton divided by 5 kilograms. That will be 1 meter per second squared. That is the acceleration in the international system, uh, international system of units. So the bar will move to the right with the acceleration A of 1 meter per second squared. How can we calculate work? In order to calculate work, we have to use the definition of work. Work of which force should be calculated? Does the problem ask you to calculate the work performed by the force of friction? No. The problem asks you to calculate the work performed by the external force, capital F. So the work performed by this particular force will be equal Force times displacement of the body. Displacement during two seconds of its motion. So we have to find the displacement. The force F is known. We have to find the displacement. Can we find the displacement if we know that the initial velocity was 0 and the acceleration was 1 meter per second squared and the time in motion was delta t given as two seconds? Certainly, we can use the same formulas here 
and the displacement d will, give, will be given as the acceleration a delta t squared over 2. Acceleration is 1 meter per second squared. We need acceleration in the right direction along the surface. It's not the acceleration of the free fall, as somebody, some of you put here, acceleration g. It's not g, certainly. It's another acceleration, 10 times smaller. It's acceleration directed along the surface in this direction. And the acceleration of free fall is directed downward. These are absolutely different quantities. So we use acceleration as 1 meter per second squared. Delta t is 2 seconds. 2 seconds squared is 4 divided by 2. So we have 2 meters. That is the displacement of the bar in 2 seconds. 2 meters in 2 seconds in uniformly accelerated motion. It's not a uniform motion. It's not the motion with constant velocity. It's uniformly accelerated motion. So the work can easily be calculated because f is known as 10 newtons. And displacement, we have found it as 2 meters. So the 10 times 2 is 20. Newton by meter is joule. So the work performed by force AF, as required in this problem, turns out to be 20 joules. And uh, what will be the kinetic energy by the end of this period of time? We also need to find a kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of the bar can easily be calculated as m v squared over 2. What is v? v is the final velocity at the end of the second, uh, at the end of this time interval of 2 seconds. Uh, so that will be m over 2. We know m, it's given. We need to find the velocity. And the final velocity in uniformly accelerated motion, the final velocity will be given as acceleration by time interval delta t. A simple kinematic formula, squared. Acceleration is 1, was found to be 1 meter per second squared. Delta t is given as 2. So this is 2 in, in round brackets squared will be 4 times mass divided by 2. So all this will give us the mass is 5. Uh, acceleration times delta t squared is 4 divided by 2. That will be 10 joules. The kinetic energy, 10 joules. The kinetic energy of the bar at the end of the given time interval of 2 seconds will be 10 joules. So the work performed is 20 joules. And the kinetic energy turns out to be 10 joules. We have lost 10 joules of work. Where does the remaining 10 joules of work, uh, where does the remaining 10, uh, the remaining work goes? So the kinetic energy is not equal to the work performed. The work is twice as the kinetic energy. Where we have lost this work, certainly against the force of friction. That uh, 10 joules, the remaining 10 joules, the difference between these two values will be the work performed against the force of friction. The force of friction, if we take it into account and if we calculate the work performed by the net force acting on uh, the bar, the net force is the vector sum of all forces that will be capital F minus small f. If we take into account this resulting or the net force, then we will, we will find that the net force performs work which will be exactly equal to the final kinetic energy. But if we take only one force out of all forces, and this single force will perform work twice as the kinetic energy, because some part of this work, 50% of this work performed, will be spent on friction, on heating the bodies, not on kinetic energy, but on heating the bodies.
That was problem number two. Now, problem number three. Find the angular acceleration of a wheel. OK. Let's draw a wheel. Find the angular acceleration. So the, according to the statement, the wheel is accelerated with some angular acceleration, which we have to find. I immediately put everything on the sketch. The, the correct sketch is very important. The correct drawing is very important to understand the problem and to solve it. So uh, find uh, uh, the angular acceleration of the wheel if the vector of the total acceleration of a point on the rim. So here is a arbitrary point on the rim of the, of the wheel. And we have a vector of total acceleration. It forms the angle alpha 30 degrees with the direction of linear velocity of the point. After one second of acceleration, accelerated motion, accelerated rotation, after one second of uniformly accelerated motion, has begun. So we have this time interval of one second. From the initial uh, position of zero angular velocity, the wheel starts moving, starts rotating with angular acceleration. And in one second, something happened. What? The vector of total acceleration of this point turned out to be directed at 30 degrees to the vector of linear velocity. Where is the vector of linear velocity if the body, if this point is rotating about point O? The linear velocity will be this vector. The linear velocity is tangential vector, tangential to uh, the trajectory <coughs> of this point. And what are the accelerations here involved? If we have some linear velocity, then surely there will be some vector of centripetal acceleration. This is AC, the vector of centripetal acceleration. And we know what is centripetal acceleration in magnitude. This is V squared over radius, V squared over radius <coughs> of the wheel. And also, there is angular acceleration, epsilon. And so there must be a tangential acceleration directed along the tangential line to the trajectory of this point. Tangential acceleration is related to angular acceleration. It's equal to angular acceleration times radius. All these are simple formulas from kinematics of rotational motion. And we discussed this kinematics of rotational motion. So we have tangential acceleration directed along the tangential line. That vector is the vector of tangential acceleration. And uh, another acceleration is the centripetal acceleration directed to the center. So the total acceleration will be a vector sum of these two vectors. In order to find the vector sum, I have to build a parallelogram, in this case, a uh, rectangle. And the diagonal of this rectangular uh, figure will be a total acceleration. So the problem says that the vector of total acceleration is directed at 30 degrees to the vector of linear velocity. So this angle is alpha. This angle is 30 degrees. <coughs> And uh, also this one, also this angle is 30 degrees. And it means that uh, 
the centripetal acceleration, I mean the value, uh, the magnitude of this vector or the length of this vector over the total acceleration will be what? An opposite leg in this red triangle divided by uh, hypotenuse will be, by definition, sine alpha. And if alpha is 30 degrees, then sine will be 1 over 2. It means that the centripetal acceleration is total acceleration divided by 2. And the magnitude of total acceleration, as the vector of total acceleration is the vector sum of these two, the vector of total acceleration is a centripetal acceleration vector plus the vector of tangential acceleration. Then the magnitude of total acceleration will be given, according to Pythagorean theorem, will be given as the magnitude of centripetal acceleration squared plus the magnitude of tangential acceleration squared. And we know that centripetal acceleration must be equal to total acceleration in magnitude divided by 2. We can use this quantity here. And uh, then this equation will be what? a squared, I will uh, take the square of this equation, will be equal to centripetal acceleration squared plus tangential acceleration squared. In other words, a squared will be equal to what? If centripetal acceleration is, uh, if, if uh, total acceleration will be two times centripetal acceleration, that will be more logical to put here. Total acceleration A will be equal to two times centripetal acceleration from this equation. So instead of total acceleration, I use two times centripetal acceleration squared. And uh, when, I, when I square this, I will have to take 2 squared. That will be 4. OK, don't forget about it. 2 squared times AC squared will be equal to AC squared plus tangential acceleration. And from this equation, we obtain that uh, AC squared here out of these two terms will be equal to a t squared, tangential acceleration squared. What is a c squared? Uh, and, and hence, the um, centripetal acceleration will be equal to tangential. Or something, something seems to be wrong here. I have made a mistake. I have already made a mistake. OK, good. Uh, I was in a hurry, and I see something's wrong. Why? Because if centripetal acceleration equals the tangential acceleration, if this centripetal equals the tangential, then this angle will be 45 degrees, will be 45 degrees. That will be an isosceles triangle. Uh, but it's not 45 degrees, it's 30 degrees. So there is somewhere a mistake. There is a mistake somewhere in my calculations. Well, let's find it. Uh, total acceleration is. That is correct. That seems to be also correct. <coughs> a what? Yes, sure. The tangential acceleration will be a cosine. Yes, sure. That's correct. The tangential acceleration will be a cosine alpha. That's correct. As well as the centripetal acceleration must be a sine alpha, right? a sine alpha. 
this centripetal acceleration. Yes, that is what is written here. The centripetal acceleration will be A sine alpha. That's correct. <coughs> and the sine of 30 degrees is just 1 over 2. <coughs> so what's wrong here? Uh, OK, we may put it this way. Ah, sure. I told you that I have to take 2 squared, but I have forgotten about it. If I take 2 squared, there it will be 4, certainly. The, the mistake was here. 2 squared is 4. So 4 minus 1 will be 3. That's it. I have just forgotten to, to take 2 squared here in this, in this place. So everything was, uh, all other things were correct. That is a squared, and a equals two centripetal accelerations. Two. Two squared will be, will be four. Four minus one, three. That's, now everything is OK. So <coughs> um, now based on this, relationship between centripetal acceleration and tangential acceleration, we can solve this problem. We can solve it easily. And this relationship was obtained from the Pythagorean theorem and the fact that sine alpha is given. And so we know that that's the relationship between the total acceleration and centripetal is just uh, centripetal is total divided by 2. That is given in the problem, and that is the Pythagorean theorem. And out of these two facts, we obtained this relationship between the tangential and centripetal acceleration. So according to this formula, uh, we, can, we can use the centripetal acceleration. Where is it? Here we have found that centripetal acceleration, the formula for centripetal acceleration. We can use it here in this equation. And the tangential acceleration is given by this formula, and we can use it here. And then by combining these two expressions, we, sure, we will be sure to find the answer to the problem. We'll, we, will, we, will be sure, we will be able to find the angular acceleration, because angular acceleration is uh, related to these two accelerations. Well, let's do it without any haste. So 3 times centripetal acceleration squared, that will be, and the centripetal acceleration is given by this formula, which is v squared. I put it again over r. And uh, we may recall that the angular velocity is related to the velocity, tangential velocity of this point by a tangential velocity divided by r. So if we, uh, so that angular velocity is v divided by r. And v squared divided by r can be put as v squared multiplied by r and divided by r squared. I multiplied nominator and denomina denominator of this formula by r by the radius. Nothing changed. But now I can see that velocity divided by r squared is omega squared times radius. <coughs> so that is the centripetal acceleration. And I will use it here. 3 times centripetal acceleration squared. That will be centripetal acceleration squared equals the tangential acceleration. And tangential acceleration is epsilon r. And it must be squared. That's it. We can cancel by, by r. It will be 3 omega to the power of 4. r squared here and r squared here will cancel. So that will be epsilon squared, the angular acceleration squared. 
And we know the relationship between the angular acceleration and uh, We know the relationship between the angular velocity and angular acceleration. Uh, the relationship is angular velocity is angular acceleration times delta t. A simple kinematic formula, absolutely analogous to the linear acceleration dependence on uh, the linear velocity dependence on the acceleration linear dip velocity is acceleration times delta t. The linear velocity is proportional to the time interval in motion if the initial velocity was zero, and this is the linear acceleration. The same formula is for angular velocity and angular acceleration. So uh, if we use this equation here, we will obtain 3 times omega to the power of 4. That will be epsilon delta t to the power of 4 equal epsilon squared. From here we have 3. Delta t is what? 1 second. So 1 to the power of 4 will be 1. That will give us 3 epsilon to the power of 4 equal to epsilon squared. We can cancel by epsilon squared. That will give us epsilon squared in the left-hand left side of this equation. We will obtain 3 epsilon squared equal to 1. And epsilon from here equal to 1 over square root of 3. That's it, the final answer to the problem. We have found the angular acceleration. What will be the units of measurement? Certainly 1 over second squared, because this is the angular acceleration in international system, in SI system. And uh, everything is given here in international system. Seconds and uh, everything is just seconds, so that will be uh, 1 over second squared. <coughs> angular acceleration is found. Yes, that's. Uh, simple equation. We, we based our derivation on this simple equation, which is the consequence of the Pythagorean theorem and some simple relationship between the angular velocity and angular acceleration and uh, certainly tangential acceleration and angular acceleration and uh, uh, centripetal acceleration and angular velocity, etc., etc. Just the formulas of uh, kinematic formulas of uh, rotational motion of uniformly accelerated rotational motion. That's it. Well, uh, originally, yes, it's a, uh, it's a good point to discuss. Originally, I made a mistake here. Everybody makes mistakes. Absolutely everybody. It's very often the case that uh, that the mistake is made. The most important thing is to be able to find the mistake. The most important thing in any physical problem, in any engineering calculations, the most important is to be able to find mistakes, because mistakes are always there. You may be absolutely sure everybody does mistakes every day. So the most important thing is your ability to find the mistake. And in order to be able to find the mistake, you must always compare different components of your solution. With You must compare with, uh, with the statement of the problem, with the given quantities, and with, uh, with just a physical sense. I, is it if this relationship possible? What if, uh, what if this is 0? Can, will this be also 0? Well, you have always to think about your formulas and to uh, compare the formulas with, with, with your intuition understanding, intuitive understanding. In, classic, in classical mechanics, intuition helps. There are other branches of physics, like quantum mechanics, where intuition will not help you. So in quantum mechanics, it's much more difficult to find a mistake because intuition fails 
However, in classical mechanics and in classical calculations and in other classical branches of science, uh, the mistakes can be found when you use your intuition and your uh, intelligence and your information about the statement of the problem. So we make a small interval now. So after this short interval, we consider solution to problem four. Problem number four. Where is it? Uh, 
uh, problem forces show that for a satellite moving close to the Earth's surface along the equator, uh, moving in the eastern direction will require launching speed 11% lower than uh, moving in the western direction. So we have the Earth. And uh, if this is the North Pole, then the Earth will rotate to the east in this direction. And that will be the radius of our planet. And the radius is supposed to be known quantity in this problem. So if you launch the satellite to move in the eastern direction, then the launching velocity, the velocity will be 11% smaller than uh, if you launch the satellite in the western direction. So that is to the east and that is to the west. Because the Earth is already rotating in this direction. <coughs> so when, you, when the satellite rotates about the Earth using the low orbit close to the Earth's surface, then the radius of this orbit is practically equal to the radius of the planet, because the radius of planet Earth is about 6,400 kilometers. About 6,400. Uh, 6, and the height of the orbit of low satellites, low orbit satellites, the height is about 100 kilometers, maybe 200. Anyway, this, uh, this value is much smaller than the radius of the planet. So if this is the height which is actually from 1 to 200 kilometers for low orbit satellites, then anyway, the radius will be much, much larger than the height of the satellites. So we can use the radius as the, the, the planet radius as the radius for the low orbit satellite, the, the radius of the orbit uh, of satellite. So we can take this quantity, not taking into account the height of the orbit. <coughs> that is for low orbits. <coughs> so what will be the velocity of the satellite? We know that the centripetal acceleration, here I use the orbit radius, which is practically the same as the Earth's radius. And this is the centripetal acceleration directed towards the center. Centripetal acceleration here directed towards the center. This must be actually equal to the acceleration of free fall. That is the main idea to calculate the orbital velocity. From here, we find that the orbital velocity is square root of acceleration of free fall g times radius of our planet. And if you substitute all the quantities here, acceleration of free fall about 10, and radius of our planet about 6,400 kilometers, then you will obtain that this is approximately 8 kilometers per second. Eight thousand, eight thousand meters per second, eight kilometers per second, approximately. If you calculate it exactly, taking into account that acceleration of free fall is nine point eight, and if you take the exact radius, then you will obtain the exact figure of close to nine uh, seven thousand nine hundred meters per second. That is more exact figure, but also approximate more exact, but also approximate. <coughs> so <coughs> the angular velocity, this is the linear velocity, but the angular velocity of the satellite, angular velocity of the satellite will be what? A linear velocity divided by r. That you can easily calculate it. You take the linear velocity and divide it by r. 
you can divide by R this formula, and you will take, you will obtain g divided by r. That is the linear velocity, the, uh, the angular velocity of satellite. Or you may use only linear velocity of satellite and linear velocity of the point on the surface of the planet. Uh, so the, the point on the surface, any point on the surface of the planet, moves with some linear velocity, its own velocity. And that velocity on the point of the, of the point, let us denote it by u, and that velocity will be equal to to what? That is the uh, uh, a total length of equator, which is two pi r. The total length of equator will be covered in one. Uh, in day in 24 hours in 24 hours any point on the equator will make a total revolution so that will be a period of rotation of our planet uh, the total length of this uh, uh, circle will be a circumference will be 2 pi r divided by the time interval that is the period of rotation of our planet if you calculate it the linear velocity will, will turn out to be 2 pi multiplied by r, which is 6,400 kilometers. And if I wanted to make in meters, I will, I will have to take into account that there are 1,000 meters in one kilometer. So this is in meters. And uh, the period of rotation is 24 hours. And each hour is 3,600 seconds to put it, I want to use the uh, SI system, International System of Meters and Seconds. So 24 hours times the number of seconds in one hour, that is 60 minutes time, times 60 seconds in one minute. And uh, if you carry out all this calculation, you will obtain, <coughs> uh, you will obtain the linear velocity which is about uh, 463, which is about 463 meters per second. Almost half a kilometer per second. Almost half a kilometer. 463 meters per second. That is the linear velocity of any point on the equator due to rotation of the planet Earth. The velocity here in Moscow will be approximately half this velocity, but also it will be 200 and something, about 200 meters per second. That is the velocity with which we move because the Earth is rotating. So <coughs> the satellite velocity, the satellite linear velocity is about 8 kilometers per second, about. But the Earth is rotating in the eastern direction with the velocity almost half a kilometer per second. This is quite a considerable velocity. Uh, the question is, if we launch the satellite to the east, its linear velocity will be, well, I told you, 7,900 meters per second. But if we law, if we launch the satellite to the west, what will be its linear velocity? The same. The same, because linear velocity depends only on the radius of the planet and the acceleration of free fall. The acceleration of free fall will be the same for any object close to the surface of the planet. No matter where this object moves, to the right or to the left, downward or upward, no matter where does the object move. Uh, the acceleration of free fall will be the same for any object. That is the experimental fact. Well, is it always correct? Is it always so? No, no, it's not always so. In general theory of relativity, this acceleration will depend on whether you move to the south or to, to the east or to the west. If you rotate in clockwise direction, 
or in counterclockwise direction, the acceleration will be different in, in general theory of relativity. But this difference will be observable only in very, very strong gravitational fields. In very strong, when you have a very heavy body here and very strong gravitational fields, then the acceleration of free fall will depend on where you move. If you move together with the rotating body in the same direction, or if you move in counter direction to the rotating body, then the acceleration of free fall will be different. That is in very strong gravitational fields. In, in our weak gravitational field here, about around the Earth, uh, the acceleration of free fall will not depend on where you move, in which direction you move. It will be always the same. So the velocity of the satellite will be the same, regardless of where it moves. So when you launch the satellite to the east, you will have to, uh, you will have, you will, mu you must, you must accelerate the satellite to this velocity, starting from the initial velocity of 463 meters. So you will, the, the satellite which is launched to the east already has the initial velocity of about half a kilometer per second. And the satellite which is launched to the west will have no this initial velocity. It will have such a velocity directed in opposite direction. So actually, the actual velocity, to the final velocity to which the satellite must be accelerated will be equal to this velocity v minus u if the satellite goes to the east. And this final velocity, that is the first, if it goes to the east, that is denoted by final velocity for satellite moving to the east. And that will be final velocity for the second satellite moving to the west. That will be v plus u, because u will, will be the initial velocity of the satellite. If you go in this direction, the initial velocity will help you. If you go in opposite direction, the initial velocity will, uh, will uh, force you to achieve a larger final velocity. So what is the difference in percentage between these two velocities? <coughs> Uh, what's the problem says? Uh, the problem says, show that for a satellite moving in the eastern direction, the velocity required, the launch velocity, the launch speed is 11% lower than the launch velocity for the satellite moving in western direction. So what is this 11%? Uh, it's dimensionless. It's dimensionless quantity, which, which will be calculated as the difference between these two velocities divided by, by the average velocity. So that is the velocity of the satellite moving in uh, western direction minus the velocity of the satellite moving in eastern direction divided by this average velocity, which doesn't take into account any direction of motion. So this one will be v minus u, and this one will be v plus u. So in, in the nominator, we will have two u the double twice the velocity of uh, the motion of the equator divided by v. And that will be, if this figure is multiplied by 2, you will find it 9, something like 926 meters per second. And that will be 7,900 7, meters per second. That is approximately. And that, after calculating, will give you something like that, which is 11%. Certainly, this is 11%, about 
this is not an exact figure, this is an approximate figure, as anything in, in physics. Practically everything is approximate. Certainly there are some uh, exact things in physics, like the charge of one electron is exactly equal to the charge of another electron. Absolutely exactly equal. Or the charge of one electron, electrical charge, is exactly equal to the charge of one proton with the minus sign, this opposite, opposite charge. So something, some things are, some values are uh, exactly equal to something in physics. But most of what you calculate is approximate approximate to some degree of approximation like I believe if we calculate this to a more uh, to a better approximation we will obtain some some more figures here we will obtain some more more exact number but anyway we will have to finish this calculation at some point and that will be an approximate number anyway it will be approximate everything in physics is approximate except for a few uh, quantities which are known exactly, like electrical charges. It's known that the electrical charge of an, an electron is exactly equal to the electrical charge of a proton with minus sign. So uh, that, is the, that is the exact, that is the correct formula to calculate, uh, to calculate the 11% difference in velocities. <coughs> What the problem asks is to show that the two velocities differ by about 11%. Because when you launch to the east, the rotation of Earth helps you. And when you launch to the, to the west, the rotation of the Earth will be directed in opposite direction. You, you, you must move here, and you must achieve this final velocity, but the rotation of the Earth uh, will we'll have opposite direction, so you will have to accelerate your uh, satellite to a larger final velocity. <coughs> That's it. The difference is about 11%. <coughs> By the way, if you launch the satellite not from the equator, but from some uh, launching pad closer to the North Pole, like in Russia we have a northern uh, launching pads uh, closer to the city of Arkhangelsk, then the velocity of uh, the point on the surface of the ground will be much smaller than 400 meters per second, like about 100 or 150 meters per second. And the, uh, the gain will be smaller from the rotation of the planet. And if you launch the satellite from the North Pole, it will be absolutely uh, uh, the velocity, the the velocity which you need to achieve will will not depend on the direction of launching. For if you launch the satellite from the North Pole, anyway, the, you you will have to achieve the final velocity given by this formula, irrespective of where you launch the satellite. <coughs> so the Earth rotation will help you only if you are closer to equator. If you are closer to the North Pole or South Pole, it will not help you because the velocity of Earth rotation. The, the linear velocity of the points on the surface of the planet will be much smaller if you go closer to the North Pole or South Pole. So problem number five, problem number five says that a moving body of mass m makes a completely inelastic collision. So we have a body of mass m, and it's moving. The problem says it's moving. And there is another body of mass 2m, of mass 2m, and there is a completely inelastic collision. And this body was moving at some initial velocity v, and this body was at rest. A stationary body of mass m2, which was at rest. What part of the initial kinetic energy is lost in this con condition. <coughs> so, <coughs> the 
What is the initial kinetic energy? This body is moving at some initial velocity. And this body was at rest. Its velocity was 0 initially. Before the collision, the velocity of the second body was 0. So the only kinetic energy was concentrated in the first body. And the initial kinetic energy of the system of bodies was just capital M, the mass of the first body, velocity its velocity squared over 2. That was the initial kinetic energy. Final kinetic energy will be after the collision. What do we know about the collision? Collision was absolutely inelastic. It means that the two bodies stuck together, stuck together after the collision. And they moved as, one, as a whole, as a single object. So the total mass after the collision will be m plus 2m, that is 3m, the total mass of two stuck bodies uh, stuck together will be 3m times final velocity of the system squared over 2. So the system after collision will have some velocity u. That will be final velocity. The total mass of the moving body, will, which will consist of two bodies stuck together. Why do they stuck, stick together? Because the collision is absolutely inelastic. And some final velocity, we don't know the final velocity. We have to find it in order to calculate the final kinetic energy. We have to calculate it. <coughs> and by the way, the problem says what part of the initial kinetic energy is lost? What is the part? It may be one half, for example, or one third, or two thirds, or, well, the part is, well, equation. Uh, sorry, I don't hear you. Yes, they have to stick together. Yes. If they don't stick together, if they after collision, if they go away, if they go apart, that will not be inelastic. The, no. If if they don't stick together, if they have some relative velocity after collision, then the collision will not be inelastic. Absolutely inelastic collision is when the two bodies don't move with respect to one another after the collision. That is, the relative velocity is zero. That is, they are at rest with respect to one another. Because the collision is absolutely inelastic. So they will have the same velocity. The first body after collision and the second body after collision will have the same velocity. They will go as a whole together, sticking together, that is. That is the, in, by definition, what is the inelastic collision? By definition, it's such a collision that after the collision, the two collided bodies have uh, zero velocity with respect to one another, that is. So we have to find the final velocity of the system of two bodies after collision. And uh, how can we do it? We can use the law of conservation of momentum. Well, we recall that the law of conservation of momentum applies to a system, a closed system of bodies, such a system of bodies that uh, no outside bodies interact on it, no interaction with the outside world. There is only the interaction between the uh, colliding bodies. That is true in this particular case. That is true. The two bodies interact only between each other, and they don't interact with the outside world. Therefore, all the interaction with the outside world is negligible. That is the case in this problem, certainly. That is why we can use the law of conservation of momentum. So it says that the initial momentum of the system equals the final momentum after the collision. The initial momentum was the mass of the moving body times its velocity. The second body had zero velocity, so it will have no <coughs> contribution to the initial momentum. The initial momentum consists only of the momentum of the first body. The momentum of the second body was zero because its velocity was zero. So the initial momentum equals the final momentum of the system of bodies. The final momentum will be defined by the total mass of the bodies, 3m, times final velocity u of both bodies. From this equation, we can easily find the final velocity, which will be the initial velocity divided by 3. C 
So here we can calculate this expression using the final velocity as v divided by 3. So it will give us v squared divided by 3 squared, which is 9. So 9 and 3 can be canceled, which, which gives you 3 in denominator, and that will give you capital M v squared divided by 2 times 3, which is 6. Now, what is what part of initial uh, what part of the initial kinetic energy is lost? If the energy is lost, it means that the initial kinetic energy is larger than the final kinetic energy, and the quantity initial kinetic energy minus final is positive. The initial kinetic energy is larger than the final kinetic energy. That is the amount of lost energy. To answer the question, which part? is lost. We must divide it by initial kinetic energy. That will be the part of the lost kinetic energy. If you only calculate the denominator of this formula, you will obtain the lost amount of kinetic energy. The problem does not require of you to calculate the lost amount of kinetic energy. It says, what is the lost part? Be attentive to the words, to the wording of the problem statement. It, it requires to calculate the part the, of initial kinetic energy which was lost in the collision. And the part is just 20% or 25%, which is a, uh, a dimensionless quantity. A part of something is dimensionless quantity. So in order to obtain a dimensionless quantity, we have to divide the, loose, the lost energy by the initial energy. That will be the part of initial energy. So by substituting here, we obtain it by dividing. It will be 1 minus uh, final kinetic energy divided by initial kinetic energy. And that will give you 1 minus what is final mv squared divided by 6. And what is initial, which must be in the, do in the denominator, which will be that will be mv squared by 2 m v squared divided by 2, and 2 will go to the denominator. So it will be 1 minus 2 divided by 6. 2 divided by 6 is 1 third. 1 minus 1 minus 1 third is 2 thirds. That is 2 thirds of initial kinetic energy will be lost. In other words, the lost kinetic energy, which is k, initial minus k final initial is larger than final will be which part of the initial kinetic energy which part of k will be two thirds of initial kinetic energy that is the answer which part of initial kinetic energy is lost two thirds of initial kinetic energy is lost that is the lost amount of energy that is the correct answer to to the last problem Unfortunately, every student who took this written test, every student made a mistake at least in one problem. At least in one problem. So, <coughs> uh, You know the, the rules established at the Department of General Physics. Uh, when you come to the final exam, you will have some accumulated score. Uh, accumulated score is the total mark which somehow uh, <coughs> qualifies your work during the semester. And this final score uh, is the result of adding all the points which you acquire during the semester. And uh, the first, you will have some points given to you for the written test. The maximum number of points is five. The second, you will be given some points for the first 
home assignment. When you defend your home assignment, that is when you uh, explain to me how you solved the problems. Not all of them, but one, two, or three problems. So the result of your home assignment will give you some more points to your final score, to your accumulated score. The maximum points for your home assignment is three. The same number of points can be obtained for the second home assignment. If you are an excellent student, you will obtain three points for the first home assignment and three points for the second home assignment and five points for maximum for the written test. That is, the maximum number of points obtained will be 11, which is very good, because there will be a final written exam, which again can give you five points maximum. Five problems, one point for each problem, if solved correctly. So the maximum number of points which a student may obtain during the semester is 16. Five for the first written test, five for the written exam, and three for the first home assignment, and three for the final home assignment, number two. The maximum possible number of points obtained by an excellent student is 16. And when you, when you come to an oral exam, you will be, uh, your knowledge will be assessed according to a 10-point scale. So 10 points is maximum, and uh, which is excellent mark, and uh, zero points is minimum when you know nothing. Uh, <coughs> so when you come to an oral exam in physics, you will be given a mark, you will be given a number of points for your answer at the oral exam, and the number of points given to you according to our rules, may not exceed the accumulated score. And your accumulated score, maximum, uh, maximum accumulated score is 16, as I explained earlier. So if you are an excellent student, you acquired 16 points, and you come to the oral exam, and you will be most probably given the maximum possible mark, that is 10 points. But Suppose you are not an excellent student and you obtained less than 16 points. For example, two points for the first written text, uh, test and two points for the written exam, that will give you four points, and one point for the first assignment and one point for the second assignment, that will give you in total six points. It means that at the oral exam, you will not have given more than six points mark. In according to 10 point scale. So at the oral exam, you will be given just six points, your accumulated score, if, you answer, if your answer is excellent. You may not obtain a mark larger than the accumulated score, which you obtained, you accumulated during the semester. So the final mark at the oral exam in physics depends on the accumulated score, that is, depends on your work during the semester. It's impossible to obtain excellent mark at the final exam if you, if you didn't work during the semester, if you, didn't, uh, if you haven't uh, submitted um, written uh, your home assignments, if you was very poor at the written test. It's impossible to, to obtain a good mark at the oral exam. The final MAC will heavily depend on your performance during the semester. That is the reason, that is the reason behind all this system of marks and points. Uh, the Department of General Physics de decided to stimulate students uh, to, to hard work during the semester because we, we understand it's impossible to, to learn physics without regular studies without regular work. You must work regularly, and you must work hard. If not every day, then every week. At least every week, you must spend many hours to learn physics, to solve problems, and to increase and improve your knowledge and understanding of physics. Without such heavy work, hard work during the semester, it's impossible to acquire good knowledge, and it will be impossible to to get a good mark at final exam. So the mark at the final exam uh, 
depends on your performance during the semester, not only on your answer at the exam, but also on your performance during the semester. That is the main idea behind this system of marks and points. <coughs> that is, uh, we are very close to the end of this lecture. Okay, four minutes, another four minutes. Well, I will start a new topic now. If we have another four minutes, I will start a new topic after all these uh, explanations about the exams and points. The new topic will be um, liquids. We will study some laws regarding liquids. Uh, the most important liquid for us is water. And uh, everybody knows the properties of water. Everybody has seen water. And everybody knows that <coughs> a water is is wet. <laughs> sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's hot, sometimes water solidifies, that is, turns into ice, and sometimes water is evaporated, <coughs> that is, turns into vapor. But some physical properties of water uh, are very simple. I will start from the first property of water. The first property is that the surface of water, whatever you take, so you take a liquid here, not, not, ex not necessarily water, any liquid. If the liquid is in static equilibrium, if it's static, then the surface of the liquid will be perpendicular to the acceleration of free fall. The vector of acceleration of free fall is vertical, and uh, we say it's directed to the center of the planet. It's not always true. It's an approximation. Uh, but the surface of the water is perpendicular to the vector of acceleration of free fall. That is true for static equilibrium, for a liquid in static equilibrium. If, if it were not so, if, if the surface was directed at some angle to the horizontal, then any droplet of liquid here, any droplet of liquid, will tend to move down along this inclined surface of liquid. And therefore, there will be some motion of liquid. And motion means that we have no static equilibrium. We don't consider motion of liquid. Motion of liquid is much more complicated thing. It's studied in hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamics is a complicated theoretical science, and we don't consider it in general physics. In general physics, we consider only the simplest case, the case when there is no motion of, of, pa of the parts of the liquid. So if there is no motion, if the speed of, the speed of every, every point in the liquid is zero, then the surface of the liquid is perpendicular to the acceleration of free fall, always. Uh, OK, we have just started. We have just started to discuss liquids, and I have, I have had enough time to discuss the first property, only the first property. We will have six or seven different properties, and we will discuss them later at the, second, at the, following, at the next lecture. At this point, let us finish this lecture. Goodbye, everybody.